Welcome to Season 5 of the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom, where we talk with enterprise and technology platform leaders about the people, processes, and platforms that make marketing and customer experience successful, scalable, and sustainable. This is what creates an Agile brand. I'm your host, Greg Kilstrom, advisor and consultant for Fortune 1000 marketing and CX leaders and teams as principal and chief strategist at GK5A and best-selling author, keynote speaker, entrepreneur, and Agile certified coach. The Agile Brand Podcast is brought to you by Tech Systems, an industry leader in full-stack technology services, talent services, and real-world application. For more information, go to teksystems.com. To sign up for the Agile Brand newsletter and get the latest insights and articles on marketing technology and CX, or to purchase a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, go to gregkillstrom.com. You can also find all my books on Amazon and other retailers. And now on to the show. Today, we're going to talk about growing current leaders and aspiring leaders into the best possible version of themselves. To help me discuss this topic, I'd like to welcome Nate Prosser. Nate has been in the field of learning and leadership development across multiple industries for over 20 years. He's currently the head of learning, leadership, and change at Wawa and hosts a leadership development podcast. Nate, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Greg. Great to be here. Yeah, looking forward to talking about all this with you. So why don't we get started with you giving a little background on yourself and what you're currently doing at Wawa. And maybe for those that aren't from the Mid-Atlantic like myself and, and from Pennsylvania um, might be unfamiliar with Wawa, uh, you know, tell us a little bit about what it does. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to start with Wawa. I think the easiest way to describe it is so much more than a convenience store. So if you drive by, you might think it's a gas station or a typical convenience store like other chains, but there's some amazing differentiators about Wawa. Uh, it has a long history dating back to actually the 1800s and has gone through several iterations to what it is today. Um, it has a amazing culture, which is the thing that I love about it the most and uh, has gotten some really interesting fanfare from celebrities and others. Harry Styles, Kate Winslet, others have talked about kind of the awe of the mythical Wawa. And what really differentiates it is our employees, our associates, and the incredible deep relationships that they build with everyday customers where people come into Wawa, not just to grab their coffee, but to actually see the associates and say hello, because they brighten their day. So it's a really unique culture that I'm happy to talk more about. Really uh, privileged to be a part of the organization. And my role, as you alluded to in the opening is help people be the best version of themselves. And so whether that is through change management and rolling out new products or services or leadership development and helping them to build their capabilities or through training and development for all of our associates to feel like they can be their best selves so that they can do the best for Wawa and for our customers. So it's a really rewarding job that um, I've been doing. I've been at Wawa a little over three years. And previous to that, I, uh, worked at Vanguard in the financial services industry doing similar work. I was a teacher for a little while and, as you said, do a podcast on leadership development. So my passion is really around helping people to be their best. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, yeah, having having grown up a little bit outside Philadelphia, I'm uh, certainly a, a fan of, of Wawa and I, I can say that all the good things are true. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> um, so yeah, so let's, let's dive into the, the main topic here and talking about, as I sure. mentioned at the top of the show, you know, growing current leaders and, and aspiring leaders into the best possible version of, of themselves. And, and let's talk about why this is so important, not only to those individuals, but to the organizations themselves. So while many might understand the importance of learning and development, let's talk about this from starting from the, the brand perspective. So the market for talent, whether that's executive directors, managers, or frontline employees, um, it's always tough. You know, whether the economy is good or bad. I know, you know, we've mm -hmm. seen ups and downs, and you know, it feels like every quarter, every six months, there's some different. You know, whether it was the, you know, the great resignation. Now, you know, we're on to different yeah. buzzwords and terms. You know, it's but it's always this kind of tumultuous landscape here. So, uh, you know, how do successful brands use learning and development to counter some of these challenges? Yeah, well, I think the first part of that question, Greg, is to understand that internals are stickier, right? People that grow up through the company that 
feel like they've been invested in, feel like the company has given a lot to them, tend to be more loyal to that company and tend to stick around more. So what I often talk to folks in the industry about is it, it seems silly, but having the right KPIs and one that I think is so important as a top line when you think about learning and development is your build by ratio or the percentage of associates that you employees that you promote either internally versus hiring them externally and having a sense of what you want that to be, right? There are pros and cons to what that ratio is. You probably want a higher ratio of internal to external, but you want some external too to bring in fresh perspective so that you're not overly insular. So understanding what you want that to be, monitoring that, and then tying your programming, your learning culture, the way in which you empower leaders to coach and teach their teams in service of that ultimate outcome, which is to fill jobs internally, will one, help with your stickiness and you'll have less holes and you'll have better succession planning. But two, that brand will actually permeate to the external because those internal folks will post things on LinkedIn. They will talk to their network. They will do speaking engagements kind of like I'm doing now and to authentically talk about the great things that are happening in the company. And that will attract those externals because they will understand that the company is investing in them through learning and development, which development continues to be one of the top three things that tends to pop when you talk about prospective employees and what they want out of a company. Yeah, I, I really like that that notion of of internal and external and, and the importance of that. I mean, certainly, you know, I've seen that in my work. Uh, I deal more on the customer, the end customer side of things, but certainly knowing that there are engaged employees and 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 employees that are retained longer there's there's a lot of benefits to that in in addition to understanding that ratio of the internal external and and uh, how else does a business measure effectiveness of learning and development programs yeah so i I'll, I'll break it down into maybe three pieces uh, the first two are what are those top line outcomes and i try to differentiate between talent outcomes and business outcomes, right? So talent outcomes are things like promotion rate, retention rate, the diversity of the folks on your team, the way that you would determine high potential status and things like that. So talent outcomes and how does your leadership and development programming help to support those talent outcomes, right? People analytics. And then there are business outcomes that you want to drive. And how do does your training programs, your development hit those and correlate to those business outcomes and KPIs that you care about? So having a differentiation between those two is important. And then what typically companies do, and there are variations to this, but it all kind of anchors back to the Kirkpatrick four-level model, which is kind of the grandfather, if you will, of how people think about learning and development metrics. And level one is basically reaction. So are people satisfied with the training? That's kind of the easiest way to measure is you went to a course, did you enjoy it? Second level is what did they actually learn? So you can do things like pre and post test. And it's more a little bit more in kind of an academic sense or contained within the training experience. Level three would be performance metrics. So that's actual things that you are accountable to. And, you know, if you're in a factory, your air rate, how many items that you build, whatever it would be. So your true performance metrics, and then level four would be connecting into those talent and business outcomes. And so companies will do attributions or they will do correlation analysis to try to connect that kind of chain of evidence from, Hey, I like the training. I learned something in the training. I'm doing better on my job. That's contributing to the ultimate outcomes that we care about. So there's variations in how people do that, but that is the general suite of how people think about it. Yeah, yeah got it. And so, you know, here in, in 2023, I, th I feel like I'm obligated to ask the the questions about AI here and, and you know, just the role of, of artificial intelligence here. A lot, obviously, there's a lot of people involved in in training and learning and, uh, and development, but, you know, do you see artificial intelligence playing a role in training and development either currently or maybe in the near future? And how should businesses be considering this in their own programs? 
Yeah, I appreciate the question. I I think the answer of in learning and development and the rest of the world, it, it's going to happen. It's a question of how much, to what extent, how quickly. Yeah. I, I think it's so new, the, the possibilities are probably endless, but I can give you three use cases that kind of pop to mind for me that are probably happening in some places, if not will happen sooner than later. So the first one I would talk about would be knowledge and content management and kind of serving things up in real time in a media that's absorbable, right? So people will often talk about learning in the flow of work. How can I, you know, not pause and, and take a class or pause and even watch a YouTube video, but how can the information come to me right in the point of need almost seamlessly and I keep working without pause. So you can think about folks using almost a smart speaker that is tied to their exact content management and you ask it a question and the speak the speaker answers right back to you. I think that's a incredible use case in sort of the retail industry. But for desk workers too, right? You can search into something and it can service up exactly what you need in um, you know, more intelligently than a Google search would, but it's tied to sort of your internal processes and your internal content management. So I think that's use case number one. Use case number two, I would call out would be rapid content creation. So those in the industry like me that are actually building courseware or building learning experiences or trying to engage, how can you take advantage of the tools that are there to write copy quicker, I think eventually to build slides, to build videos and images that kind of tell your story and do that at a much quicker pace where you can customize and sort of personalize content for folks that's going to be exactly what they need and you can build that at scale through AI. And the third one that I think is interesting is what I would describe as essentially robo instructors, right? So you can think about an experience, one of the most core skills of a leader that is giving feedback and giving feedback in an effective way so that you can fuel performance and help people feel like they're growing. So the skill of giving feedback well is a really challenging one to master that takes a ton of practice. And really the best way to do that is through role play. But in the probably not too distant future, there's probably a robot on the other side of that where I can role play a feedback experience and probably get feedback on not only what I said, but probably some version of how I said it and my body language and things like that. So there are some tools out there that you can basically give a presentation into your phone and it will give you some feedback on how effective your communication was. So I think some version of robo instructors is probably the third piece that comes to mind. And I'll give you a bonus of like a, a quick sidebar on this. So thinking about right now, freely available chat GPT available to folks. And one of the challenges that we see a lot of leaders having is giving very clear expectations. So if you look at any engagement survey, Gallup and otherwise, one of the questions is usually how clear are the expectations for you? Do you know what's expected of you? And that tends to rate pretty low. And in some cases, lower than 50% of employees will say they know what's expected of them, right? So you can think about all the wasted time an employee is doing on things that they don't know is the most impactful work. And what I found in uh, the times I've used chat GPT is the prompts that you give it are going to give a, a quality or not so quality response. And it's really about the clarity that you can give the tool. So if you are a leader that's trying to improve your ability to set clear expectations and communicate very precisely and clearly with your team, play around on chat GPT, see what you get back. And if you're not getting back useful information, it's probably because you are not being clear enough with the tool of what you want. And that's a skill that you can work on and just kind of play around on the app. And as you get better at it, you're probably going to also get better. And that's going to transfer to your ability to communicate with the team. So even small things like that, I think are going to start to permeate into the development of people. Yeah, that's really interesting because, you know, the 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 role of prompt engineer, you know, I've seen a few job descriptions for things like that. And, you know, it, at, at first it kind of reminded me of, if there was a role for like Google searcher or something, but you, you bring up a good point because, yeah. you know, to be able to explain and, and articulate something to something like chat GPT also means that you're thinking through the questions that you're at, you know, you're not just asking for a, an, the easy answer. You're, you're actually putting thought into yeah. constructing the, the query, which I think is, is, is something that, 
can be applied to to a lot of, of other things. That, that's interesting. Before we continue, I'd like to introduce you to a sponsor of the show, Partner Hero. Customer service outsourcing has long been available mainly to large enterprise businesses with long-term contracts and onerous procurement processes. Partner Hero is challenging business as usual and bringing the benefits of outsourcing to small and medium businesses as well as startups. With short, flexible contracts and fast ramp-up times, Partner Hero is making customer support outsourcing a viable option for small and medium businesses and startups. It's perfect for companies with seasonality expecting a temporary spike in volume or that simply need to scale up. And their focus on quality means your customers will get an experience that feels like it comes from your team. If you're ready to bring in outside customer support help for your company that feels like it's part of your existing team, check out Partner Hero. Head on over to partnerhero.com slash agile, that's partnerhero.com slash A-G-I-L-E, to book a free consultation with their solutions team. Mention you heard about Partner Hero from the Agile brand and the way of the setup fee. Now let's get back to the show. So let's, um, we, we touched on this a little bit from the employee perspective, but want to want to dive in a little bit more, um, you know, as opposed to from the brand or, or the company perspective, okay. from the employee perspective. And, you know, so as I mentioned, you know, all, all of those things, great resignation, you know, talent shortages, whether it's the, the employer or the employee, employees market, so to speak, in the, in the talent market, you know, obviously companies have been looking at that from their perspective, but, you know, employees have certainly had their share of challenges as well as opportunities over the last, not only several years, but probably for, for quite a while. But what should employees be looking at, you know, given whether, whether it's a good employee employment market or not, you know, mention kind of doubling down on, on what you were saying about the, the importance of those internals and just the value of those employees that, that choose to stay in an organization, what should either current or, or potential, you know, employees looking for, for new jobs be looking for so they can have more long-term success in their careers? Yeah, I appreciate the question, Greg. Um, you know, a little bit matters on the goals. I'm going to assume that we're talking about someone that's probably ambitious, that wants to continue to develop, you know, early in their career, mid to their career, and is kind of looking to to build their way. So assuming that profile, this might be a unique answer. People will often look at development, but they'll more often ask questions around like, what development programs do you have? Do you have a rotational program where I can do six months in you know, three different departments and get well-rounded and that sets me up for a next promotion or something like that? And they look at it more from a programming perspective. I think one of the best ways that if you're interviewing is to probe into what is the leader's expectation in my development? How is that incentivized? How is that monitored? And how is that built into your ecosystem? So to give you an example, if there is a company where the development of other is built into the leader's competency framework, it's also built into their potential assessment. It's built into the way that they are appraised and reviewed at the end of the year. It's built into their bonus and merit calculation. It is a part of the culture. That culture is something where the leader every day is just as much expected to come up with new ideas and drive operational efficiency. They're also expected to spend time with their team, coach them, develop them, make them better, serve them up with the experiences and exposure to help them get to the next level. If that is built into the ecosystem, the programming and everything else around it are going to work. A lot of development is localized, is driven through the leader. So I would highly recommend folks to understand what is the expectation of my direct leader to develop me. And if it is a casual, yeah, yeah, that's important. And it's not built into any of the talent ecosystem. It's probably not going to happen to the extent that you want. And you're going to be there wishing that you had more opportunities. So that would be my first question is what, what do leaders need to do in terms of development? And then you can kind of branch out from there. And usually that's more of like a second, third tertiary question, as opposed to a focal point. I think flipping that on its head is a really good way to understand the culture. Yeah, that's, that's really, I've, you know, I've never heard that before. It, it makes so much sense, but that's, that's really, that's a really good, good thing to keep in mind. What about those that are maybe early in their career and they want to eventually be leaders? 
anything different or additional that they should be paying attention to now early on in their career so that they can not only be better leaders, but get those opportunities to become leaders? Yeah, I always tell aspiring leaders to realize that it's essentially a completely different job and to make sure that they actually want to lead and to lead people. Or do they really want to climb the ladder? They want promotions, they want money, they want status, those things. And it's okay to want those things, but it's hard to be successful as a leader. It's also hard to break into leadership unless you truly want it. And one of the toughest things about leadership is you have to genuinely get energized and feel fulfilled at times when you don't do anything. You simply set the person up on your team to be the one that is in the limelight, is the one to be successful, and you are comfortable being behind the scenes. If you aren't at that level of professional maturity and you don't want to step into what we subscribe to at Wawa, and I personally fully believe in is the concept of servant leadership, which is your role is to serve others before you serve your yourself. And if you still have that element of selfishness, it, it is hard to break through into leadership. So I encourage people to really be introspective about that, to play out scenarios in their head where, again, they are kind of in the shadows and propping someone else up and how they feel about that. And if they get sort of indirect fulfillment by helping others. And then if they do really want to take that plunge, I teach habits. So I really ground to this concept of leadership habits and something I quote is uh, the research will say that we tend to go on to autopilot upwards of 40% of the time. So if anyone's had the experience where they're driving to work and then they blink and all of a sudden they're at work and they don't really remember because they were on autopilot and thinking about something in their head, you actually do that in a leadership context often as well, where someone comes to you, an example I give is someone comes to you with bad news you have a habitual response to that in the way you react. You might sort of attack that person. You might ask, why didn't you tell me sooner? You might say, who, who should be in trouble for this? Why did this happen? Your habitual response might not be, thank you for telling me that. Let's work through how we can solve that together. And so yeah. becoming self-aware and conscious of your habits to these different trigger points. And before you build bad habits that you need to break, build positive leadership focused habits. So you go into autopilot and you make your team feel comfortable. You make your team feel psychologically safe. You coach them, develop them. And if you do those things, they will run through walls for you. And not only will you be the one, you know, having to do the work, you will have an army of people that are kind of marching in the same direction. So there's a, a lot packed into that, Greg, but my advice is make sure that you really want to do it. And then if you do be conscious and kind of hack your habits to make them positive. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, there's d definitely a lot in there. I, I, I wish we would have had this conversation about 20 some years ago <laughs> for, for me, <laughs> but no, the, a, a lot of, a lot of great advice in there. I also have to ask, you know, looking at this from the, the, those aspiring leaders now, you know, what AI is going to be going to play a, a continually an increasing role, let's say, in, in a lot of a lot of different ways. What should those aspiring leaders be paying attention to when it comes to AI? Yeah, I, I think it's to your point, it's it's here to stay. I, I'm guessing your audience is probably in tune to that. Some of the folks that I talk to are kind of hoping to bury their head in the sand that it won't <laughs> be a part of the future. So I think just acknowledging that one, it, it's going to be here. I think being curious and talking to folks that know more about it than you do, widening your perspective. And I often think, I often describe creativity as connecting seemingly unrelated ideas. So getting different perspective and having different things in your purview and sort of connecting the stuff that you talk about all the time of, you know, customer needs employee needs how do you think about those things and how can you creatively connect opportunities within ai so i i don't have a amazing answer from a technical perspective i think it's one to embrace it but the kind of secondary piece i would say to this greg is caution of overusing or forgetting about the people impact to it so some people will call them soft skills i prefer to call them power skills but understanding that 
AI is going to have significant change impact on your people, on your team. It might place people out of jobs. It might require them to fundamentally switch their careers. And the people impact of that is going to be really significant. So if you're not thoughtful about the way you communicate it, if you don't work with HR representative, a change leader, a leadership development expert, there will be challenges in the way you sort of communicate job changes and things like that. So I would definitely recommend people get some consultation if those things are happening. If you have an inkling that AI is going to fundamentally change business processes and otherwise that will impact the people, we tend to think about the people towards the end and last and resistance from people is the number one thing that causes change to fail. So I would say make sure that you are thinking about the people up front. And if you feel like you're out over your skis of how to do that, get some consultation from people that are experts in the HR space. Yeah. Yeah. I love, love that. So last thing I wanted to talk about is your podcast. Uh, it's called Leadership Chalk Talk and, you know, how that's a, a win-win with your, your role at, at Wawa. So I always think it's exciting when leaders at brands have their own brand that complements and, and builds on their role and, and their you know day job, so to speak. Can you talk a little bit about that? And you know how, how do the two help one another? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, to first give the listeners a little bit of context of Leadership Chalk Talk. So it's a passion project of mine that combines essentially my two favorite things, which is one, helping people, as I mentioned in the opening, and sports. I, I love sports. Uh, I do a, a lot of, you know, teaching and executive coaching and things like that. I found myself making a lot of sports analogies that I know is not inclusive to everyone. Not everyone connects to sports the way I do. So I started to temper those analogies. And then this podcast gives me sort of the freedom to make as many and as intricate of mm -hmm. analogies and connections of sports and leadership as I want. So as an example, one of our most downloaded episodes is around giving effective feedback, which I mentioned is a really fundamental skill for all leaders. And there's a million podcasts and articles and books on how to give feedback. What I think is really unique about the way I did it is LeBron James, one of the most famous athletes in the world. I went through his 20 year career and gave him 10 pieces of advice through feedback. And so I took press conferences of things that he said, interviews that he gave after games, and then gave him feedback on the way that he answered those questions. I connected different dots of best practices around feedback, one of which my favorite is no feedback triangles, which means never give feedback on about someone to someone else, go directly to that person. So don't do a triangle, do a straight line. So it's a fun way to learn 10 tips about how to give effective feedback, but to also kind of relive LeBron's amazing 20 year career. So there's plenty of other episodes like that, but it's a nice. unique way. And what I try to explain is it's leadership development made fun. It, it keeps it engaging and helps people to, to build their skills. Nice. Nice. Yeah. So you asked the question about the brand, uh, what I think is great. So Wawa does have a committee to sort of approve outside ventures like that. And um, the response that I got is it, it's all upside for Wawa because it's dually beneficial. What I think is really cool is we have a number of folks in our operation. So Wawa has over a thousand stores. So a lot of people are on the road, right? Going to different stores, our multi-unit leaders, our executives go to different stores. So podcast is a great medium for them to absorb and to develop themselves when they're driving from store to store. So there's a number of internal Wawa associates that love the podcast, that reach out to me, that give me suggestions of episodes. So I think it's beneficial from that point. It's also beneficial from the external brand perspective. Um, I post things through LinkedIn, otherwise through the website. So people can see that the head of leadership development at Wawa loves leadership development so much that not only does he do it as his full-time day job, but he also does it in his spare time as well to kind of promote this concept that um, I always talk about, which is, I really believe that the world needs more leaders and leadership chalk talk. That's essentially our mission is to help people to hone their leadership skills and to make the world a better place. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. That's great. And, and always great to see that kind of support as well from uh from from your employer well nate thanks so much for joining the show i've got one last question before we wrap up here so looking at some advice for for other brands that 
want to take some steps to improve their learning and development programs, what, what's what's something they could do today to to start making their their learning and development programs better? Yeah, I mentioned this before, Greg. I would go back to that idea of I always look at learning and development as a means to an end. And the end is that you have associates or employees that are fully competent and confident, right? They have the skills that are needed to drive the business and the strategy that you put forward. And they feel confident in doing that so that they feel fulfilled and they continue to grow and they feel better. So knowing that that is kind of the end goal in mind, don't have learning and development be an isolated on the side thing, bake it into everything. So I threw out some examples before of have development as a part of your competency model, have learning and growth a part of your culture and speak to that in get your CEO and CHRO to speak to that at company events, make it feel like it is more than just going to a class, but it's a part of our ecosystem because when people are developing, they're going to build the skills that are going to better serve the company. They're also going to be like we talked about earlier, they're going to be stickier because they feel like they're getting a lot out of the company. They are growing and they are getting better. So I would say broaden it to just the concept of thinking about traditional going to a classroom and make it a part of an ecosystem. So I'll I'll close on that, Greg. I, I wanted to really thank you for having me on. This was great discussion. You asked some really powerful questions that made me think and hopefully I gave the listeners some nuggets and that they're happy to continue to go on their leadership journey. Because as I said, I do believe the world needs more leaders. And so we need more of you building those skills and and serving others. So thanks again for having me off. Yeah, no, thank you. This was, this was great. Again, I'd like to thank Nate Prosser for joining the show. You can learn more about Nate, Wawa, and the Leadership Chalk Talk podcast by following the links in the show notes. Thanks again for listening to the Agile Brand with Greg Kilstrom podcast brought to you by Tech Systems. If you enjoyed the show, please take a minute to subscribe on your podcast channel of choice and leave us a rating so that others can find the show more easily. You can access more episodes of the show at www.gregkilstrom.com. That's G-R-E-G-K-I-H-L-S-T-R-O-M.com. To get a copy of my latest book, House of the Customer, visit my website or you can find it on Amazon or other retailers. The Agile brand is produced by Missing Link, a Latina-owned, strategy-driven, creatively-fueled production co-op. From ideation to creation, they craft human connections through intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Until next time, stay agile.